The ICFRC hosts community programs to address topics of international interest. We want to thank our members, our volunteers, and our interns for making these forums possible since 1983. And because it's March Madness, I thought I'd find a little <clears throat> uh, basketball trivia. 1983 was the last year that Lute Olson coached the men and the first year that Vivian Stringer coached the women. Anyway, I want to acknowledge our university and community sponsors, the U of I International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Programs, the University of Iowa Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their key financial support, as well as today's special sponsors, Midwest One Bank, Conrad Schultz, and Mason K. Braverman. I also want to thank City Channel 4 for professionally recording our programs for Cablecast on City Channel 4 or 118-2 and the U of I Libraries Digital Archives. I also want to add that over 220 of our ICFRC podcasts can now be found on iTunes. Mm -hmm. And now getting to our speaker. Gabrielle Fellerini is an associate professor, as I said, at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the director of the Hydro Science and Engineering. He received his MS in Civil Engineering in 2003 from the University of Rome and his PhD in Civil and Environmental Engineering in 2008 from right here at the University of Iowa. He also received his Executive MBA from across the street at the Tippy School of Business. His research focuses on flood hydrology, extreme events, hydroclimatology, and climate predictions. He has received a number of national and international awards, including the Hydrological Sciences Outstanding Young Scientist Award by the European Geoscience Union in 2013, as well as others. He's a fellow at the American Geophysical Union and has published over 160 peer-received papers. And today he will provide us an overview of heavy rainfall and flooding associated with tropical cyclones. Oh, using a combination of observations and outputs from climate models, please join us and welcoming Gabriel Villaridi. Thank you. Thank you very much for the for the introduction. Uh, I I do have an accent, so there's nothing wrong with your hearing. It's just uh, um, I'm Italian originally, born and raised, and uh, came here for my doctoral uh, studies and never uh, never left. Uh, today I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work I've been doing for the past uh, 10 plus years related to heavy rainfall, flooding, and tropical cyclones. And to a certain extent, this is one of those topics that uh, I feel uh, I can relate to. So those couple of pictures you see here on the screens, those are associated with uh, Hurricane Irene in 2011. So after I left uh, Iowa, I went to Princeton, New Jersey for uh, as a researcher, and uh, in 2011, uh, I experienced the Hurricane Irene that dumped a lot of rainfall over uh, uh, over New Jersey and Princeton as well. And so this is a picture um, uh, of one of the entry points to the Princeton Township. There is a car here. You only see the roof of the car. Uh, this is the Trenton metro station uh, uh, right after the event. And so it's one of those elements, like with anything that we enjoy, with anything that we do, that if there is a personal connection, it makes it so much more interesting and so much uh, makes you might work so much harder to to understand why it happened and then try to figure out how we can predict and better prepare for events of this uh, of this kinds. Uh, most likely, um, you know, you wonder tropical cyclones, hurricanes, and Iowa, and I'll give you a little bit of a snippet of why I also care about this in the context of the Midwest. And so that's going to happen uh, later in the presentation. Just want to give you a quick overview about what IIHR is. So IIHR is the research center that I direct. It's within the College of Engineering. In uh, next year, we're going to celebrate our centennial. It's the red brick building across the across the river. There is the power plant right on this other side, and uh, we are uh, we are at the forefront of research related to experimental as well theoretical fundamental uh, fluid dynamics and water related prog problems. We have about 80 researchers, PhD research level, researcher levels, and uh, over 100 students affiliated with uh, with the lab. About two thirds. PhD students, one-third uh, uh, master's students. 
And uh, as I mentioned, August 2020, we are celebrating our centennial. There's going to be a big event in coordination with uh, Hancher Auditorium, with River, River Parades and uh, uh, quite a few activities. So stay tuned and hopefully you will be able to join us for uh, that celebration. So I have structured my presentation into three main topics. One is I want to set the tone as to why we care about tropical cyclones. What are the impacts, not just in terms of uh, fatalities, economic losses, but also from a more engineering design perspective. Then I'll give you an overview of what the role of the storms has been from a climatological perspective, long-term behavior, uh, with emphasis on the uh, with emphasis on the eastern U.S., uh, but then I'll move west to the Midwest, western U.S., and then a global global view of uh, these kind of problems. And then I'll finally what I'll uh, what I'll highlight is. Uh, Given that hopefully by then I'll have convinced you that these are important top, it's an important topic to deal with, how can we better prepare for them? And so uh, I'll, start, I'll start giving you an idea of uh, how, where we are and state of the science related to predictions and then uh, show you some of the results we have obtained. Uh, so when we think about tropical cyclones, we think about a well-defined eye, we think about uh, the storm surge, we think about the winds. Uh, and uh, sure enough, if you look at the fatalities, about 50% of the fatalities in the US associated with the storms are actually tied to storm surge, with about a quarter of them tied to rainfall and flooding. When you look at it in the context of flooding and rainfall, about 50% of the storms, they cause at least one casualty. And so if you, while instead the storm surge, about 10% of the storms uh, cause at least one fatality. So you can think of this more of a distributed problem where uh, there are fewer fatalities associated with more storms when you think about heavy rainfall and flooding, or a much more concentrated acute problem when you have storm surge, when it happens, it doesn't happen uh, with respect to every storm, but when it happens, cause the uh, large amount of uh, fatalities. It's not just the social implications, it's also the economical one. So if you look at uh, these uh, results, these are insured losses uh, uh, associated with tropical cyclones going back uh, many decades. There is a thin line here that is the trend over time, uh, just to give you an idea of how these losses have been increasing, uh, uh, in particular over the last uh, several, uh, several decades. And obviously, this is a contribution of two main factors. One is the storm itself. The other is also the concentration of wealth uh, that uh, is along the coastline. And so you have more properties that could be uh, affected. And so it's a combination of, uh, combination of both. Uh, and this is not just a US problem. Uh, this is much more of a global, global issue. So if you, look at, um, if you look at the areas on the continents, uh, it gives you an idea about the mortality hazard associated, the mortality risk associated with these storms. And sure enough, the eastern, uh, eastern seaboard, the eastern US, or let's east of the Rocky Mountains, uh, it's definitely an area that has quite a bit of experience with these kind of events, but some of the most affected areas are actually here along the uh, um, Eastern Asian uh, uh, seaboard, uh, Bay of Bengal, uh, India, Pakistan. And so some of these are some of the most affected, uh, some of the most affected areas. And so it's not just a US perspective. I'm gonna have a heavy US focus, but it's a much more uh, global, uh, global uh, problem that we have to deal with. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the work I've been doing with economists at the Wharton School of Business at Pennsylvania, looking at understanding what the major drivers associated with insurance losses, uh, insurance claims have been uh, um, uh, over the eastern US. And we started simple. We said, OK, let's take one storm. And we looked at Hurricane Ivan in, 20, in uh, 2004. And what you see here are two figures. One is to the left is the storm total rainfall, how much it rained during that storm. Uh, the black line is the storm track. So you track the center of the storm as it moves uh, uh, over the US. And so you see there are areas with heavy rainfall uh, here in uh, Western North Carolina, Kentucky, Tennessee, also here in the, the Pennsylvania area. And so this is from a rainfall perspective. Then we said, OK, let's look also from a, a discharge perspective. And so sure enough, rainfall is a key ingredient for flooding. Uh, and so here you have uh, 
this flood index. The redder the color, the bigger the magnitude of the flood event. And sure enough, you see that there is a quite a bit of a resemblance between the rainfall and the flood maps. Uh, many of these areas have some of the biggest uh, um, flood magnitudes during this event. So this is from the hazard, the hydrology, the rainfall. Oh, then we said, okay, let's look at uh, National Flood Insurance Program. So I worked on they have access to the entire portfolio of the National Flood Insurance Program. And here we have two maps. The one to the left, it shows you, you see this color map on the back, uh, in the background, is the same as the one I showed you before. Gives you an idea of the magnitude of the flooding. What you see here in this, uh, uh, in this, uh, for these census tracts are the census tracts, the locations where at least one claim was filed by the, um, by the people living there uh, through the National Flood Insurance uh, Program and FEMA. And so you see that there is a nice match between uh, the areas where you have some of the largest um, flood magnitudes and the census tract uh, and areas where you would expect uh, claims to be filed. But there are also areas where this relationship breaks down. You can see here in Kentucky and Tennessee, where the data would indicate that there is quite a bit of flooding, but there are no insurance claims filed. And so then we looked more deeply into what the, what the data were telling us. And it actually turns out, and you see all of these areas, these are census tracts that don't have any flood insurance uh, uh, policies in place, which means that they couldn't, they, we don't have any claims filed because there were no policy in effect. And so they couldn't file anything. And so that's a different line of research that looks at uh, this market penetration, how well uh, people tend to buy flood insurance and what should we be doing to alleviate or mitigate some of these uh, uh, shortcomings. This is, again, we started simple one storm, and then we said, okay, let's look at all the storms that happened between 2001 and 2014. Is there something, some common thread that we can understand, that some general features that would allow us to understand why, um, why we would get more or less insurance claims filed with respect to certain characteristics of these storms? And I'll tell you a little bit more, a little bit more about it in a minute. So here you have all the uh, location, all these communities where there was at least one insurance claim filed. And so you see here you have uh, in Illinois, you have uh, some of these, uh, some of these, this is actually Hurricane Ike in 2000 and, uh, 2008, uh, Eastern Seaboard, no surprises, Florida and the Gulf Coast. These are all flood related claims. There is no coastal flooding, we filtered it out. Uh, and these are uh, some of the locations where there was a major flooding as defined by the National Weather Service. And so there is a nice matching between uh, where, uh, locations where there are claims filed and major flooding. And so then we said, uh, we developed a model that accounts through everything in there and tries to learn and tell you a little bit about what the drivers were. And to no surprise, uh, what you get is that there is an increasing number of claims when you have bigger flood events. So the bigger the flood events, the more claims you would expect on average. The more urbanized the area was, the more claims you would get. The more the region was in a flood prone, uh, flood -prone area, the more claims uh, you would get on average, the closer you are to the coast and the bigger the storm. So the, the nice thing of this is that it's intuitive. It makes physical sense. This is probably what we would expect. But now we have a model that allows us to play games. And so for instance, we said, okay, what if the flood magnitudes will increase by five, 10, 20%? What would be the expected change in insurance claims? What if urbanization keeps on ramping up at the same level as it has been for the past 10, 15 years? How many more claims uh, would we expect? Everything else being the same. And so we played those games and I'd be happy to elaborate on those uh, um, if of interest. So up to this point, I focused a little bit more on this economic societal impacts. There is also an engineering perspective. Okay, so as engineers, we need design values to be able to design structure to sustain what colloquially we can refer to, the, let's say, the 100-year flood event. 
All right, so the way that it works is that you get uh, your discharge, you get your data. It comes like this. You say, okay, I'm gonna fit it with the distribution. And so the, the closer the dots are to the red line, the better the fit it is. And obviously I cherry pick this. This is basically as good as it gets when it comes to this uh, fitting. The reality is that oftentimes we get something like this. Okay, where you have this kind of like dog way, dog tail behavior on the upper part. And so one line of research is understanding why. Why do we see these two behaviors? There is a much more linear behavior down here and then all of a sudden it just have this uh, S shape. And so the premise, the idea that uh, we are working on is that uh, there is a mix. So some of the events are caused by certain type of storms. Some of the events are caused by other storms. And so let's bring it home. Let's think about now. We could have flood events now in Iowa City that are tied to snow melt and, we, and rainfall. And we have summertime events that are coming from this very intense uh, uh, short-lived uh, bursts of rainfall. So the idea is that instead of treating them as they were actually coming from the same group of storms, uh, we should actually stratify them and treat them as coming from two different populations, two different groups of storms. And this serves two purposes. One is that you get a better representation of the physics. It makes more physical sense. And the other that you would end up having a better characterization of this dog shape, uh, dog tail behavior. And so my focus here uh, is related to tropical cyclones and the role that these storms play in explaining some of these, uh, some of these behaviors. Uh, in, uh, when you look at uh, the federal guidelines, 1982, bulletin 17B, which is the, um, these are the guidelines for, uh, for any federal agencies to follow. They said, okay, in 1982, we don't know how to deal with these issues. And those, they listed eight main problems. In the current revision, which uh, was just published in 2018, they addressed uh, uh, four of them, the one highlighted in green. The one that they haven't touched is actually this one, identification and treatments of mix, mixed distributions, which is exactly what I was telling you about. There is the more than one system of storms that we need to mix together. Fast forward, 2018, the new revision, Bulletin 17C, they said future work, so imagine Bulletin 17D, 30 years down the road, identification and treatments of mixed distribution. This is a tough problem to deal with. We haven't been able to deal with it for in the past 30 years, and we're not planning on dealing with it until the next revision, 10, 20, 30 years in the future, okay? But this is the one that I am particularly interested, uh, interested in. So when we look at tropical cyclones, uh, the first part of this uh, presentation focus on the, focuses on data. Okay, so I've taken observed discharge and I've taken uh, uh, rainfall. Um, and I'm, what I'm showing you here is two ways of characterizing extremes. So you can think of this as basically two sides of the same coin. Think of this when I talk about the maxima or peaks over threshold, these are extremes, okay? And uh, here in the top panel, you have flooding and here in the bottom panel, you have rainfall. What I'm showing you here is out of 50 to 100 year records, what's the fraction of extremes that can be attributed to tropical cyclones? And so you have values here in the Eastern US on the order of 10, 20 to 30%, which means that about 30 to 40, 20, 30, 40% of all the extremes are coming from this kind of storms. Uh, you can also see quite a bit of a geographic uh, regional variability. You have the Appalachian Mountains here, which are going to act as a natural barrier for the storms. Uh, they cannot cross it. Uh, and then the coastal areas and Florida. So really no major surprise. And if you look at the news, uh, South Carolina, Florida, those are the areas that oftentimes are the ones affected by these, uh, uh, by these storms. Uh, this is... Uh, is not just the fraction, but you can think, okay, I'm gonna look at the top 10 largest events on record. How many of those can be attributed to tropical cyclones? And uh, the, the, the bluer the color, the more. So out of 10, you have that in many of these locations, all of the top 10 largest events, or about 80% of the largest events, are actually caused by these storms. 
And so you have, um, and there is quite a bit of a geographic arrangement. Again, Appalachian Mountains, the Carolinas into Virginia, Maryland, and up to, up to New Jersey. You have about five, six, seven, eight of these storms that cause the biggest events on record. I would say that these are big events, big deals, and those are the ones that I get excited to, uh, to look at. Uh, we can say, okay, over the past 50 to 60 to 70 years, uh, do we see a change in the magnitude of these events? And uh, the data do not tell us uh, that, yes, there, is, there has been a change. It doesn't tell us that there hasn't been, but it doesn't tell us that there isn't uh, one either. And so this is consistent uh, whether you're looking at rainfall and flooding. So based on historical records, we cannot detect change in the magnitude of these, uh, of these events. But we can definitely look, find uh, an impact when it comes to urbanization. So we did a study focusing on uh, Hurricane Harvey in Houston last year. And what we were trying to understand is uh, Houston is a big city that has developed over the, mo over the past uh, 30 to 40 years. Can we understand the role that the city played in exacerbating uh, the flood event and the catastrophic impacts of these storms? As from a hydrologic perspective, we know that when it rains uh, in an urban areas, um, we have a very different response than when if, if it were to um, rain over a more agricultural landscape. You can expect that you have no infiltration. Imagine when it uh, rains in a parking lot compared to a field. You have no infiltration and you have a much faster response and you have bigger flood peaks. So from a hydrologic perspective, we had that, that sense. What we also looked at is not the hydrologic response, but it's also looking at uh, how the city changed the rainfall, uh, the storm total rainfall from this event. So looking at the role of the city in changing the rainfall, as well as the hydrologic response. And so to do this, uh, this is the observations. This is uh, what we were able to obtain by looking at uh, uh, numerical models that allow you to capture the effect of the buildings on the landscape. And then we said, OK, let's take Houston, rewind the clock back. Let's put cropland instead of the buildings. Everything else has been the same. And this is what you get down here. And so in a sense, the difference between these two is the relative effect of the urban areas. Because everything else was the same. We just removed the city, the urban areas, and we put cropland. Okay? And so you can already see that the colors are quite a bit, uh, quite a bit different. There are a number of details that I am completely sweeping under the rug. And the details are associated to understanding why the city caused this announcement in terms of rainfall. And it boils down to thinking of uh, um, air that flows over a smooth surface compared to air that flows over uh, a rougher surface. And then there are a number of drivers, a number of mechanisms that play, play a role in there. But so there is an effect, and it's a significant one. This is the rainfall. Now let's look at the discharge. I, I try to think of problems, I try to make them simple before starting making my life complicated and then boil down to simpler approaches. And so I said, look, I play with data, I can develop reasonably good statistical models, and so all I'm saying is, Houston, discharge, what do I expect the main drivers to be? Rainfall, I need rainfall to happen, and uh, Urbanization. So these are urban watersheds, that, uh, urban basins that had developed over time. So I said, can I explain the changes from one year to the next in flooding for Houston uh, just using these two pieces of information, rainfall and the level of urbanization for the basins? That's it. And so this is what you get. So the circles are actually the observations. Uh, focus on the red line. The red line is kind of like the best guess for, uh, uh, from the modeling perspective. A uh, couple of points. One, the top panel, you see that there isn't much going on until Harvey, is this uh, basin here, which is, uh, you can look at it as your benchmark, is a basin that hasn't been developed. And so sure enough, urbanization did not play a role there. But it was good to, to see that happening. Uh, all of these other ones are more urbanized watersheds, and sure enough, there is, the, there is an increase. Uh, 
uh, there is an overall tendency and an overall increase. But again, thinking how simple these models are and how well they get me to where I need to be, I call this. Uh, I can call this a success. So now I have two models. I have a model for rainfall and I have a model for discharge. And so now again, I can play games. Now I can say from a hydrologic perspective, what happens if I wind the clock back to 1950 and I use the urbanization in 1950, constant, no changes. And then I superimpose the rainfall as it happened. What's gonna happen? And so you see here to the left, uh, the blue, uh, the red line is the model that I showed you before. The blue line is the model where urbanization was kept constant in 1950. And so here you see that the further away you go from 1950, the bigger the impacts, which makes sense. You see these departures between the blue and the red lines. The, this is my control watershed, the, the one that hasn't experienced urbanization. Sure enough, there is no difference. Urbanization didn't play a role. And so it doesn't make sense if you are in 1950. It doesn't make a difference if you're in 1950 or 2017. And now I can bring it all together. On the left panel, I just showed you the hydrologic impacts. But now I also have a rainfall impacts. I know that Harvey, the city, announced the, the rainfall from the storms. And so now I can say, OK, what if I keep urbanization in the 1950 and I consider the landscape covered by cropland? I combine both of these effects, and this is what you get to the left. Uh, without getting into the details, you can see that uh, the red line is what I uh, what I would have gotten uh, what I got in the present time. The further you are to the left, the bigger the effect of urbanization. And so I can boil down these pieces of information in telling you that uh, the city of Houston, at least for the basins that we looked at, uh, exacerbated rainfall 20-fold, uh, exacerbated flooding 20-fold. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that without the city, we wouldn't have had flooding in Houston. I mean, that was such a big event that it would have overwhelmed any system. You can't really design for your infrastructure to be able to respond to these kind of events. It doesn't mean you can't prepare, and so there are stories uh, positive stories related to the Texas Medical Center and I was able to stay open during, uh, uh, during this storm. Now, I'm going to change gear. So we went East Coast, Houston. I'm going to bring you to the, to the Midwest. And I'm going to tell you about uh, kind of like an offspring of tropical cyclones. They're called the predecessor, uh, predecessor rain events. Okay, Predecessor rain events are... Uh, uh, you have a, basically the systematics, the, what you have is a system that sits here, shoots a plume of moisture, it interacts with the weather systems here in the northern part of the uh, Midwest, at, at least a thousand, uh, a thousand kilometers away from the storm, and it causes heavy rainfall and flooding. So you can see this is southern Minnesota, uh, very large, uh, very large rainfall uh, over these events that is tied to Hurricane Erin in 2000 uh, 2007. So the storm was sitting over Oklahoma, affecting, uh, affecting the min Minnesota. So what we did, we did a study where we looked at an ensemble, a compilation of these storms. And uh, what you have, these are the six storms we looked at. Uh, and it's probably hard to see, but believe me when I say you have many locations here where you have annual maxima, so the biggest event for the year that was actually caused by these systems. And so even though they're not as significant as they would be on the east coast of the US, they still play quite a bit of a role on the, uh, across the Midwest. And this is Hurricane Ike, where you have uh, heavy rainfall flooding in Chicago up to Detroit. And so those kind of events can happen. I'm gonna skip this. Uh, we also looked at the west coast of the U.S., and I just realized I'm, I only have about 15 minutes, so I'm going to give you um, some of the highlights. Uh, we looked at flooding in the western, uh, western U.S., and what it turns out to be is that they, these storms are really not the biggest players. So when you look at the contribution, they only contribute to about three 
4%, up to 10% of uh, the extremes, but they play a much more muted role, which means that there are other drivers that are important, whether it's the snow melt, whether it's the North American monsoon, whether it's the atmospheric rivers or Pineapple Express uh, that you might hear in the, in the news. So West Coast, um, eh, not, so, not so important. Let's look at this at the global scale. I have a few, few other slides where it zooms in, but you can clearly see these are analysis done at the seasonal level where tropical cyclones contribute to up to 50% of the rainfall in quite a few regions, whether it's here in Australia or whether it's along the Chinese, uh, eastern, uh, eastern coast of Asia. When you look at extremes, now you remember for the eastern US, we were talking about 20 to 30% of the extremes are tied to tropical cyclones. When it comes to Asia and uh, Australia, you're more like 50 to 60% of all the extremes are caused by uh, tropical, uh, tropical cyclones. All right, so up to this point, uh, I hope I've done a couple of things. One is that I have made the point that these are important systems to look at, whether it's from a socioeconomic perspective or whether it's more from a, an engineering perspective. And also, yeah, the backward looking assessment. And so looking just at the historical record. Now, what I want to do for the next 15 minutes is looking forward. And so uh, what I want to try to understand is, can we predict these storms? Can we better prepare for them? And I can tell you that the answer is going to be uh, more and more disappointing in terms of how well we can do, the more refined the question I'm going to ask. And so I'm going to start simple. And I'm going to say, can I predict the overall number of storms uh, in the North Atlantic? Okay, so how many storms do I expect on a yearly basis? Again, simplicity. Don't worry about the details. What we've done is though we have developed a simple model that if I know what the sea surface temperature is in the Atlantic and in the tropics, uh, I can model very nicely the year-to-year -year changes and the multi-decadal variations in uh, the number of storms. So if you look at the Circles, these are the observations, and the white line is, in a sense, one way of estimating it. And so you get the year-to-year -year changes as well as this multi-decadal multi uh, variability, okay? Now, the, we also looked at other metrics. So this is just the number of storms. We also looked at two metrics that look at both the number of storms, their duration, and their intensity. You put them all together, okay? And again, the, the, the circles are the observations, the, and these are the results from the model. Again, for, uh, uh, for anybody who has messed around with this kind of approaches, uh, these results are, uh, are actually very um, satisfactory. You know, you still have quite a bit of scatter, quite a bit of variability, but again, remember, you're trying to reproduce nature with just two numbers. So. Now, what we've done is, OK, if I know the forecast of these two predictors, the forecast of this information, can I predict the overall number of storms? And can I do so skillfully? And the answer is yes. Uh, we can actually, so if you look at the, the circles, these are the observations, what we're trying to mimic. And what you see here with these gray colors are our forecasts. These are forecasts that we issue in, uh, starting from November up to August. So the hurricane season, the tropical cyclone season starts in June and it goes until November. So what we are actually showing is that there is skill in forecasting the overall North Atlantic activity uh, as the current one is coming to an end. So in November, we are able to skillfully forecast the upcoming season. And so this has a number of repercussions from an economic perspective, given that many of the insurance contracts are signed by January 1st. And so having the information ahead of time can, can be useful from, uh, from that point of view. Uh, how well can we do? So the redder the color, the better it is. It goes between zero and one in this case. Uh, this is the shortest lead time, and this is the longest lead time. So this is November of the previous year. This is way, way closer and into the season itself. There are a number of approaches that we have dealt, uh, the, that we have uh, developed, uh, trying to figure out how to best mix information. 
uh, if you focus on this one, which is what we perceive to be the best one, you have a skill that persists quite a bit, several months ahead of time. Obviously, the further out you go in time, the lower the skill you would expect. It's trying to predict uh, rainfall and flooding today for tomorrow versus over the next six months. So there is a loss of skill uh, the longer the lead time. But overall, these results are actually very encouraging. And so that was nice because we were able to um, to show that there is skill. There is memory in the system that we can leverage. We've also done it not just using statistical methods, but using outputs from uh, global climate models. Um, the circles are uh, the observation, the, um, the black line is the observations, uh, and you can look at the green line uh, as uh, the model forecast. And so what it shows is actually that even using global climate models with the high resolution, uh, we are getting to the point where we can directly forecast the occurrence of, this, uh, of these events. Now, this is the, probably the best and the most optimistic piece of the story. We, can, uh, we have shown skill in doing that. And it's not just us. I'm giving you my perspective uh, related to these problems, but there are other research groups that perform this kind of work routinely, whether it's a Colorado State, whether there are federal labs. This is just our approach to this. And so if you look at 2010, what you see is that this is what was observed. And these were like a bunch of forecasts. So it was good. There was quite a bit of skill in there. Now, the problem is that this is not, not even like a completely fully solved problem, because look at 2013. These were the observations, and this is what everybody was uh, predicting. So we still have room to grow. To me, the biggest problem is that uh, 2010, which we forecasted really well, had basically no landfall activity for the US. 2013, which we already didn't forecast well, has a few storms that affected the US coastline. And so again, it's, uh, we start simple, overall activity, but that's probably not what we want. What can I do with that piece of information if I want to prepare? What does it tell me about the regional activity? What does it tell me about uh, certain parts of the US versus others? And this is what we, are what we have done then. We started simple and now we refine the question. Can we forecast landfall activity? And the answer is uh, mm, kinda. So this is uh, some of the modeling results looking at the uh, sub-basin scale. So instead of just showing you how well we can do across the entire North Atlantic, I'm showing you results of how well we have been able to do at a much more regional, regional scale. So there is some... Uh, um, you know, some silver lining. There is something good that is going to come out of this. Uh, it's not just the overall uh, number of storms. What about major storms? Category three to five. We are getting there. We're not there yet, but we're moving definitely in the right, uh, right direction using uh, the best physics and the best understanding of the processes that we have. What about uh, landfall activity? So here what I'm showing you is for these uh, blue areas, so it's the US coastline, Hawaii, and the Caribbean, uh, we were actually able to develop some, to show that there is some skill in predicting the landfall activity. So this is good. This is getting closer to what the kind of information that we would need. It's probably not granular enough to get us where we need to be, but it's getting there. And I'm going to skip this because, again, overall activity, regional scale, I'm an hydrologist. I'm interested in the rainfall and the flooding, so I'm going to ask an even more complex question. Can I forecast the rainfall associated with storms and make landfall somewhere along the coastline? So again, as I said, the more refined the question is, uh, you know, the less... Uh, positive of an outlook we have, but I look at it as the glass half full, and there is room to, for improvement. And so this is a really complex problem. If you look at some of the statements by the American Meteorological Society, it says this is a tough problem to deal with. There is, a, it's an elusive, as I say, the problem remains elusive. And we have done work, I'm not gonna uh, talk about it, but looking at even at the short term, over the next two days to five days. How well can we forecast the rainfall from these storms? 
And so if we're not really there when it comes to overall rainfall at such a short time scale, I'm asking season months ahead. So you can imagine that probably the answer is worse than uh, at the two days. And so, again, first of all, we have to understand, are the models fit for purpose? Before we ask, can they tell me about the future? What we want to ask is, can they reproduce the historical past when everything else is uh, idealized? And so we are looking at different uh, model versions. This is a high resolution model. This is a lower resolution model. And these are the observations, what we're trying to reproduce. And when you look at uh, relative contribution of TCs uh, to rainfall for a given uh, region of the world, you know, it's pretty impressive. You look at Australia, the high resolution models actually captures very well uh, the areas where you would expect a larger contribution. So this, were, this was encouraging. Without asking the forecasting, I'm just asking, if I tell you everything, the best that I can, can you tell me what the rainfall from these storms would be? And the answer is uh, yes, I can, the model can do something. Now the problem becomes when I'm asking you, can you forecast the rainfall coming from the models? And this is where uh, things start breaking down. Start breaking down in the sense that it gives me an idea about that this is uh, forecast initialized in July for a July to November season. It's right at the beginning of the season. So it, there is some regional skill, which part of it is tied to the fact that the model expects storms to make, land, make landfall in certain areas. The biggest issue is that when the focus up here, when I tell the model, uh, give me the changes in rainfall from one year to the next uh, coming from the storms, uh, basically there is no scale. Uh, a white color, it tells basically you're just, there is nothing. And actually when you account for all the problems with it and you look at the bottom panel, you see that you have all these blues, which means it's negative, which basically tells you you'd be better off using climatology, what has happened over the past 10, 20, 30 years, rather than asking the model to give you the year-to-year -year changes. Again, this is, uh, this is basically the first time that uh, there has been a quantification of how well we can do. And I look at this as, uh, all right, so now we know where we are. Let's try to do better. And so just to wrap this up, um, I just have three main key points. One is that these storms, they play a significant role in terms of uh, uh, flood peaks and extreme events, especially along the eastern uh, uh, part of the US, so when we take a US-centric perspective, but much more uh, globally, of, uh, much more globally, especially in, uh, in Asia, Eastern Asia. Uh, what, we, what we've been able to show is that uh, the more general the question, the better we do. So there is quite a bit of skill in forecasting overall activity. The skill reduces when we try to ask uh, activity for a specific part of the coastline, and even less so when you try to ask about rainfall. And this is the problem, is that the forecasting of rainfall associated with these storms becomes problematic, and there is quite a bit of uh, room to grow into. So with that, I'll uh, take it from here, and I'll... I'll answer questions as they are. Thank you. Um, we'll start uh, here. I think will be an easy one. Cyclone versus hurricane. What is the difference? Yes. So I, as I mentioned, I probably swept a bunch of uh, details under the rug. Um, the biggest difference is related to intensity. How strong the winds are associated with this uh, with these storms. I refer to tropical cyclones as. Uh, any kind, of, um, any kind of storm, regardless of its intensity. When you look at hurricanes, you're looking at the more extreme ones, the upper tail, the ones that are associated with bigger, uh, stronger winds. Um, and even hurricanes, there is a general category, category, category one to five for hurricanes. And then there are major hurricanes, which are category three to five with wind speeds uh, that are much, much larger. Um, are you or anybody else, are you working on um, or working with urban planners so they can plan and reduce the impacts of tropical cyclones on urban areas? Yeah, so this is, uh, the, the short answer is not, at least not at this point. Uh, but Houston, what it did, and this is, you know, when we did it, that was the first study of that kind. And so 
from my perspective, it raised a bunch of questions. A bunch of questions related to was Harvey and Houston a special case? How can we generalize it? But also, when I talk about the city, I don't know whether the spatial extent of the city or the height of the buildings, what was the relative contributions of these uh, of this, uh, of this events. And so there would definitely be something uh, to, look, uh, to look for uh, moving, uh, moving forward. The other is, uh, how can this kind of information uh, help with uh, future developments? Is there something that we might want to do differently than we are currently doing? And this is where working with uh, urban planners would definitely be very useful. You mentioned that predicting rainfall remains elusive and subjective. Does this mean we can't trust our local meteorologists? <laughs> no. So uh, that was, first of all, it was the rainfall from a tropical cyclones that I was referring to. The other element is this. Uh, if you think about the storm and you are look at the forecast, you are asking two pieces of information into one. You are asking, give me the track correctly. And so if you look at the hurricane forecast, there are these cones of uncertainty, uh, cones, of un cones of uncertainty. And uh, not only give me the right track, but also put the right rainfall around that track. And so you have two uncertainties, one from the track and one from the rainfall around it. Uh, Rainfall is much harder to predict than the temperature. We probably can predict rainfall a few days ahead without really making huge mistakes. Rainfall is a much more complex, uh, much more complex problem. And so, oh, no, I would not uh, say that our meteorologists are uh, giving us the wrong information. Um, aside from insurance, are there any other economic drivers pushing landfall activity prediction software? And are there any countries making significantly larger strikes in this area of research than the U.S.? So my, most of my experience has been with the, with the U.S. I used to work, uh, when I was in Princeton, I used to work, uh, my position was funded through a reinsurance company out of the U.K., and so my focus was on U.S., uh, um, US-centric, uh, and I cannot really comment too much about other parts of the other parts of the world, mostly because I haven't been involved directly. Uh, my interest in this problem, you know, even from an insurance problem, it's a big problem because you have two pulling effects. One is uh, uh, we have a national flood insurance program that is managed by FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, and you know, I don't remember how many tens of billions of dollars FEMA is uh, in the hole right now after all of these events. And then on the other hand, you have uh, uh, the private sector that could start playing a role, uh, but there are a number of complications that, uh, uh, that are involved. Hurricanes are important for a number of issues. It's not just insurance perspective. Hurricanes have also been identified as drought busters, especially in the southeastern U.S. When uh, you go through a period of uh, a drought period, you just need one or two of these events to actually get you out of uh, droughts. Uh, there are ecological implications uh, with the occurrence of these events in terms of the coral health uh, and how these storms can uh, impact that. So it's not just an economic perspective. That's the one that I've been focusing on the most, uh, but there are also other uh, more broad implications related to, to these kind of problems. Okay. And uh, comparing medium-term forecasts 20 years ago with two years ago, can one tease out any effects of climate change? All right, so a couple of, uh, couple of points. One, uh, I, 20 years ago, we couldn't do what we're doing right now. And so I would decouple the questions into two parts. How much, how much better have we gotten over time compared to do we see a climate change signal into the, in these storms? So I'm going to start by answering the first one. Uh, there has been improvement in terms of short-term forecasting, so especially the intensity of the storms. Uh, but that was it. So most of the attention has been on the rainfall and on the, on the wind speed, the magnitude of this, the magnitude of the storms and their tracking. There has been really little related to, uh, to heavy rainfall and flooding. And so I cannot tell you how it was 20 years ago because nobody really looked at it. 
Uh, the other element is that when you look at this on a seasonal time scale, 20 years ago, we didn't have the computational power to run the models that we are running today. So, and again, this is probably what I showed you. You can look at it as a benchmark. So the 20 years down the road, uh, when I'll come back and you'll ask me, how has it gone over the past 20 years? I can show you this and then relate it to the more updated one. Uh, climate change. Well, it depends on what you're looking at. Uh, we did work related to the role of uh, what the projected changes in uh, uh, hurricane activity would be, as well as the potential response of rainfall. Uh, what it turns out is that, at least uh, based on uh, some of the work we've done and other studies in the literature, uh, there is not an expected increase in the frequency of the events but rather there is more of an expected increase in the intensity. So the number is roughly gonna stay the same with periods of more or less activity like we are experiencing today, but the storms will tend to become, uh, to become uh, larger. And uh, overall it's expected an increase in the rainfall associated with these storms, a projected increase on the order of 10 to 20%, so. Uh. The last question is, can you tell us more about the upcoming anniversary of the IIHR, um, Hydro Science and Engineering? Um. Yes, so it's a three-pronged approach. So we're going to start with uh, IIHR birthday party. Then there's going to be a... Um, river extravaganza, and I'll tell you a little bit more together with Hancher. And then there's gonna be a flood management conference uh, following up to that. So it's gonna be a week long event, at least from an IIHR slash Hancher perspective. Uh, it's gonna be three days. It's gonna be, I believe, uh, the week before class starts in 2020. It's not just the event per se. It's a series of, uh, it's a year long celebration. There is gonna be a theme semester related to flow at the university, there is collaboration with outreach activities across the state. Uh, and then uh, this, uh, this event is going to be um, kind of like the, the frosting over the cake. And we're going to have a river parade. So we're going to have a parade in the river with floats. Uh, there's going to be circus. There's going to be a tightrope walker across the Iowa River. There's going to be... Um, they're called architects of air. They make sculptures with uh, um, kind of like, I don't want to call them balloons, but they make sculptures. So they play with lights and music and you can walk in. Uh, uh, there's going to be ballet dancing and music concerts. Uh, it's going to be amazing. So <laughs> August of uh, 2020. We now conclude our program, and I want to just all give a big thank to Gabriel Villarini for his presentation. And once more, I want to thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their generous support. And also, uh, again, thanking today's special sponsors, Midwest One, Conrad Schultz, and Mason K. Braverman, and of course, City Channel 4 for making our programs available for viewing audience. Um, so, Gabriel, now as a token of our appreciation, we present you with the coveted, can't get this in Rome, uh, Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. Awesome. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, and we are adjourned. <laughs>